Honorable Chief Justice of India, Justice Datu Ji, Honorable Chief Minister of Chhattisgarh, Dr. Raman Singh Ji, Honorable Chief Justice of the High Court of Chhattisgarh, Justice Naveen Sinha Ji, Shri Mahesh Garda, Minister of Law, Government of Chhattisgarh, Shri Prem Prakash Dube, Minister of Higher Education, Government of Chhattisgarh, Professor Sukhpal Singh, Vice Chancellor of this University, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I am happy to be here in Raipur to address today's convocation. This first visit of mine to Raipur is an eye-opener. Naya Raipur is an excellent example in city planning, and I felicitate the Honorable Chief Minister Raman Singh Ji and the Chhattisgarh administration for the good work that is being done. This university, ladies and gentlemen, is named after a former Chief Justice of India and an eminent jurist who, as Professor Upendra Bakshi put it, lived the life of law and justice and was an effortless exemplar of judicial virtues. The aim of a law school, said an eminent American judge of yesteryears, is not to make men smart, but to make them wise in their calling. The main part of intellectual education, he added, is not the acquisition of facts, but learning how to make facts live. In a similar vein, Lord Denning's advice to young lawyers, and I quote him, a lawyer without a background in history and literature is like a mason whose only job is to fix brick upon brick. But with a strong background of history and literature, a lawyer is like an architect who can visualize the entire edifice that will endure for decades." End of quote. Our society, friends, professes to live by law, and legal education ultimately ensures the efficacy of the justice administration system in the country. This day, therefore, marks an important stage in the training of young legal minds present here. Our founding fathers resolved to make India a sovereign democratic republic with a view to secure to all its citizens justice, liberty, and equality, and thereby achieve fraternity that would assure the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. To this end, we adopted the Constitution of India as the fundamental law of the land to guide us in all matters of legislative, executive, and judicial action. The Constitution and the judicial structure emanating from it is premised on the concept of the rule of law. As students of law, this audience is familiar with it, and many would have read and digested the standard texts prescribed in the curricula of studies. The term itself has deep roots in history, but in its modern form was specifically enunciated in the late 19th century by the British jurist Albert Dicey. To him, the essentials of the rule of law were, one, the absolute supremacy of regular law, two, equality before the law, and three, access to justice and development of law by judges on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Echoing Dicey, the philosopher John Rawls has stressed that there is no offense without a law. As he put it, no lapina sine lege. This requirement in turn demands that laws be known, that they be general, that penal laws should not be retroactive to the disadvantage of those to whom they apply, and finally, that the legal system must respect the dictates of natural justice. Since justice is the first virtue of institutions, and the rights secured by justice are not subject to political bargaining or to calculus of social interests. In terms of the institutions of the state, the classical approach to rule of law implies their functioning in terms of the limits prescribed by the basic law of the land so that the possibility is excluded as Montesquieu put it, of the enactment of tyrannical laws or their execution in a tyrannical manner. This further safeguarded by the judicial power discharging its functions independently of the legislature and the executive. Thus, the essence is that all authority, all authority, is subject to and constrained by law. Over time and in different societies, these principles have been challenged, amplified, and modified. Upendra Bakshi has sought to read the rule of law as going beyond a mere division of functions in modes of governance. To him, it is the rule of good law and is as such reflective of the struggle of a people to make power accountable, governance just, and state ethical. He opines that the Indian constitutional conception of the rule of law links four core ingredients. One is right, second is development, third is governance, and the fourth is justice. The Constitution of India embodies the modern concept of rule of law with the establishment of a judicial system which should be able to work impartially and free from all influences. Its section on fundamental rights elucidates this in some detail. These include inter alia, Article 14, which guarantees equality before law and equal protection of laws. Article 15 prevents discrimination on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth, and provides for affirmative action for socially and educationally backward classes of citizens and for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Article 16 provides for equality of opportunity in matters of public employment. Article 19 guarantees certain freedoms, including those of speech and expression. Article 21 guarantees that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to the procedure established by law. Article 22 provides protection against arrest and detention. Article 25 guarantees the right to freedom of conscience and free profession, practice, and propagation of religion. Article 29 protects the cultural and educational rights of minorities. And Article 32 guarantees the right to move the Supreme Court of India to ensure the enforcement of fundamental rights conferred on citizens under Part 3 of the Constitution. The rule of law, said the Supreme Court in Dalmia Cement case of 1996, 
is a potent instrument of social justice to bring about equality in results. In the Golaknath case, the meaning and scope of rule of law under the Indian Constitution was expanded. It is now regarded as a part of the basic structure of the Constitution and therefore cannot be abrogated or curtailed even by the Parliament. In the case of Bachan Singh versus the state of Punjab, the court emphasized that rule of law excludes arbitrariness and unreasonableness. To ensure this, it suggested that while it is necessary to have a democratic legislature to make laws, its power should not be unfettered and that there should be an independent judiciary to protect the citizens against the excesses of executive and legislative power. In the Manika Gandhi case, the Supreme Court established the requirement of reasonableness and non-arbitrariness of procedure in Articles 21 through Article 14 and ruled that a law prescribing a procedure for depriving a person of personal liberty will have to meet the requirements of Article 21 and also of Article 19 as well as of Article 14. The procedure must be just, right and fair and not arbitrary, fanciful or oppressive. It should confirm to the principles of natural justice. Earlier, a senior law officer of the government addressed this problem candidly and sought answers to specific questions. One, have the constitutional organs of the state, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary discharged the obligations placed on them by the constitution? Two, have they functioned within the limits set forth by the Constitution? Three, what is the perception of the public with regard to their functioning? And four, to what extent is the perceived erosion in their working the result of intra-institutional and inter-institutional problems? His answers to these questions were unedifying. Firstly, the rule of law in India is under serious threat. Secondly, there is a widespread popular disillusionment. Thirdly, there are cancerous developments eating into the fabric of each institution and each is destroying itself from within. And fourthly, if these trends are not arrested, they are bound to be destructive of the Indian state in the long run. In a similar vein, but commenting on the wider picture, civil society groups in the country and abroad have observed that the rule of law in India is in a downward spiral and that the primary responsibility for it lies with the delayed justice dispensation system. It would thus appear that both in terms of procedural technicalities and substantive content, there is a sense of unease with regard to the working of the rule of law. Why has this happened? The answer is to be sought in the functioning or malfunctioning of the institutions of the state that have led to this cancerous development. An institution-wise assessment would therefore be in order. The United Nations Research Institute for Social Development published in January 2006 a study of the Indian Parliament as an instrument of accountability. It concluded that the Parliament is increasingly becoming ineffective in providing 
surveillance of the executive branch of the government. One part of this is attributed to the behavior patterns of the members of parliament and the wastage of time that could otherwise be devoted to legislative duties and scrutiny of executive action. Another reason is the increasingly complexity, increasing complexity of modern governance and the resultant need for greater professionalism in legislative work. The requ requisite correctives are not forthcoming. As a result, a hobbled legislative has ceded ground not to the executive or to the external forces, but to the judiciary. In regard to the executive, the balance between the political and professional con components has been disturbed. This is evident in the functioning of the civil service and particularly of the police. Thus, the myth of authority on which the power of the state depends has been dented and resulted in what Mr. Fali Nariman has called executive underreach. As for the judiciary, the traditional public esteem for the judiciary has been reinforced by its activism in contrast to the failure of the executive to apply correctives on matters of concern. This is particularly true of its good work in expanding the ambit of rights. On the other hand, the lack of access to justice, the high cost of it, delays in the delivery of justice, lack of a mechanism for accountability, and allegations of corruption have, together, given rise to doubts and added to the pervasive pessimism about the efficacy of institutions. One law officer has also expressed concern over the increasing disregard of the salutary doctrine of precedence. Another area of concern is the excessive zeal reflected at times in the pronouncements of members of the judiciary. Some observers have asserted that the Supreme Court has given up any formal pretense to the doctrine of the separation of powers. This is perceived to upset, as a former speaker of the Lok Sabha observed, the fine constitutional balance and the democratic functioning of the state as a whole. Friends, it is evident from the foregoing that our doctrinal commitment to the rule of law notwithstanding, the implementation of the principle compels us to conclude that the glass is half full and that the shortfalls are corroding the edifice so diligently put in place by the founding fathers of the Republic. The root cause of this shortfall is the absence of what Mr. Soli Surabji has recently called the rule of law, temperament and culture. Perhaps Dr. Ambedkar had premonition of the lurking dangers. In his concluding speech in the Constituent Assembly of India in 1949, he cautioned fellow citizens about the pitfalls and offered a three-point corrective that remains relevant. These were, one, hold fast to constitutional methods of achieving our social and economic objectives. Two, not to lay their liberties at the fate feet of even of a great man, or to trust him with power which enables him to subvert their institutions. And three, make our political democracy a social democracy as well. I thank you for inviting me here today. I urge you to implement 
Ambedkar's correctives. And I wish you success and happiness. Jai Hind.